spiritual integrations. What is your definition for cognition, and what is your definition for the brain? Cognition. Yeah. Awareness. Awareness. Okay. Now, here's an ironic thought, by the way. Everything that you experience takes place in your brain, including, like, this chair. I'm not actually seeing this chair. This chair doesn't actually have the color brown. It's my brain interprets electrons, and inside my brain I have this image of my chair, and that's perception. But my entire sense of perception just exists inside my head. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's kind of a weird thought when you think about it to say, like, everything that I experience is, takes place in my head. So cognition is like the things that I'm aware of in my head, I would assume, right? And the brain is maybe what contains that awareness and that experience. But I'm not actually experiencing you over there. I'm experiencing you in here. Does that, is that, just keep that in your mind because that messes with the rules a little bit when we get a little further. Okay. <laughs> so this is where it gets complicated. What's your definition of spirit? <laughs> now we're at the Maybe. We'll see. What do you guys think? What's your definition of spirit? Come on, guys. This is a spiritual integration program. <laughs> Subconscious, physical. So. What part of you is that? What part of that is you? It's a wisp. Why is this so hard? Does anybody have any insights? Because because it's in our brain. Okay, Teresa. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Good, good, good point. Teresa's saying because it's also in my brain. So are you telling me that you experience your consciousness and your cognitions are experienced in your brain, but you're also saying that your spirituality is experienced in your brain? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I mean, it depends on your 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 you know scope. I mean, visually and, and sensory, we have our subjective experiences and sensations. That's all we have. Whether we're talking about our own thoughts, my experience of you or the chair, or of spirituality, it all takes place in my head, right? It's all experienced in my head, because if we wanted to be really objective about it we would talk to a, a theoretical physicist who would tell you that the space between atoms is 99.999% empty and that there's very, very little mass in the entire universe. <laughs> I mean to say that this chair is 99.999% nothing. That's what they would say. That's kind of weird. So why do I experience it as hard? Well, researchers and scientists would say that you don't actually ever touch it. You, you are repelled by magnetic forces. That's all your feelings, magnetic forces. You don't actually touch the chair. They also would say that, um, you know, like magnets are another example of that, where that force is extended beyond the actual, like, proximity of a certain radius. Um, but it messes with your head when you look at it from different viewpoints. We're like, well, it isn't actually yellow. That's just how my brain experiences light waves. Light waves aren't inherently brown or white. So to say that it, it's just all in my head, it's just a controlled hallucination, <laughs> for lack of a better term. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, spirit. What is spirit? Seriously, what is spirit? How is it different than anything else in your head? Is it different than anything else in your head? Or spirituality? It's a body thing. Could, so it's in your body, too. It's experienced in your body. Does anybody know where your soul resides in your body? You feel it here. You feel a sensation there. But guess what? Here's the problem. Where does that feeling take place? It takes place in your mind. <laughs> it's here. It's felt here, but that is experienced up here. Oh man, you are going, I, I, do, I, do, I can track with you and we can have that discussion and that one is another time. Like we'll get coffee on that one if you want because, because it's way worse than you've even been told. The newest research shows that it's not just in your stomach, it's also in your heart and your heart has its own central nervous system that's completely independent from your brain. And then, oh no, we just found that there's loose connected neurons in your skin. Ah, your whole body is a brain. 
Okay, so if your brain is damaged, is your spirit damaged? Yeah. Well, some people said yes, some people said no. I think so. Is your spirit, when your spirit is damaged, does your brain take damage? What's the, I think they're the same thing. I've thought about a lot about that too. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So. So. Yes. But. But. But is it? You know. Yes. I would agree with that. Uh, okay. I would agree with that. Yes. That. 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 That adds another dimension because you're make, you're thinking about it very complexly. Let me try to make it simple for you. If you damage your spirit, do you damage your brain? Yes. <laughs> I'm just trying to make I'm trying to make it woefully obvious here. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. It is wild. That is crazy. <laughs> That's messed up, <laughs> okay? That's complicated. Does having an affair screw with your brain? Yeah, it does. It really does. Okay? There's lots and lots and lots of research on what having an affair does to your brain, and it's radical. It's not subtle. It's like drugs. It just damages it. It poisons it. It toxins it. Is it? Is it? Is it? Is having an affair spiritual? Yeah, I think so. What's What's the difference? What's the, dif the What's the articulating line dividing your cognition and your spirituality? What is the dividing line between your cognitions and your spirituality? Yeah. So they affect each other. Can we divide and can we divide the two at all? How? How can we? How can we? How can we tell which one's what? <laughs> very expensive equipment. <laughs> Very expensive assessment. No. Um, I'll tell you my theory, and I'm willing to be wrong, and I would love it if you guys added to it or challenged it. But what if you are a soul? What if that's just who you are? When you get... Okay, I don't know if you guys have studied biblical theology or how much you've studied, but at the end of it all, after the day of the Lord... Do you get a body? Do you have a body? You do. Yes, you do. So we're speaking of this maybe Christian more orientation, which we don't always do, but but we can at this time. Okay, it's so come up to do that. This is Bible college, right? Or it's a Christian university. Is there a body? Yes, there's a body. What does the Bible say about not having a body during? Yeah, I mean, it actually says it's not good to be without a body, but it's better to be with the Lord than to be on earth with the suffering. That's what it says. That's what Paul says. But it's better to be the Jesus than it is to have a body. But it's better to have both, <laughs> which is, again, after the day of the Lord. It's pretty spiritual stuff. I know that maybe people are on different spectrums on that. I get that. I want to respect where you are. But we are a Christian university, so we're going to go there a little bit. <laughs> um, what if we're just a spirit? What if you are a soul? Does that include your body? Could it include your body? Is there room for that? I like it too. It took me a long time. I put a lot of thought into it. I think you are a soul. And I think that if I lose my arm, am I affected spiritually by that? I think so. I'm going to have a spiritual crisis if I lose my arm. I am. Okay? It's going to lead to a spiritual crisis. I guarantee it. I'll be depressed. It's going to affect my brain. It's going to affect my soul. I'm going to have a grieving period. I'm going to have a hurt period. I'm going to have an existential crisis, and I'm going to yell at God for a while if I lose my arm. Okay? It's spiritual. It's physical. I can't differentiate the two. They are permanently integrated. You're here talking about how do we integrate spiritual integrations. How can you not? <laughs> okay, you have integrated them. They are integrated. They're completely integrated. It's our awareness that they're integrated that should change our behavior. That you are a spiritual being. How does that affect how you treat people, how you give counsel, how you live your life? How does it affect your existential perspective? That's more practical than arguing about what's spiritual and what's not. It's all spiritual. What is it that Ron Swanson said in Parks and Recreation? <laughs> he, said, he said, Ron, that's not the attitude of an award winner. And he says, what? <laughs> he says, everything I do is the attitude of an award winner because I have won an award. 
Everything you do is a spiritual act because you are a spirit. You have a spirit. This is who you are. It's a part of who you are. It's a permanently integrated part of your existence. Therefore, everything you do is spiritual. And that, I think, is the implications of spiritual integrations. Not trying to integrate them, but accepting that they are integrated and letting it affect the way that you see people and the way that you see yourself. Is that fair? I just love that you just dropped that. Into yes. With of course. <laughs> <laughs> We've talked a lot about integration, too, haven't we? Hey, you get the idea what integration is? <laughs> I know, I do. I love the integration. I love using Ron Swanson and all kinds of TV shows in there. But we've used this all for two days. We've been talking about integration with the brain. Does it integrate the soul? Like, like if we heal the brain, are we working with the soul? I think we are. Like, like what happens when, when people have a spiritual experience and now 80% of them can corner that addiction? Was that, is that spiritual or is that neurological or is it absolutely both? And can we not separate the two? Like when somebody can reinvent themselves to the point of total transformation, was it, was it cognitive, was it neurological or was it spiritual? And is it ever not all of them? It's always all of them, it's always, it's always all. They don't, un they don't, they're never not integrated. They're always integrated. It's our awareness and acceptance of that that changes our perspective about ourselves and other people. That's what I think spiritual integration is. Is that different than what other teachers are teaching? Or is, it, is that what everyone else is saying? I don't know that I would comment. Oh, there's an, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, this is supposed to be a part of every program. Good. Yes. The spiritual conflict. Yeah. No, you're good. You're good. No, no, yeah. No, I want you to keep wrestling with it. I'm just also, um, I'm struggling with the awareness of time. That's my struggle. I'm sorry. So, but I do want you to keep thinking about that. That I do love this topic. It's really important, especially if you haven't had a spiritual integrations class. Like, we should expect more on this discussion. We should be able to talk more about it. There should be more implications. Like, this should be a strong focus of who we are. Like, what is the spiritual integration should be an important part of this experience in this class, or not this class, but all classes with you. Like I want your feedback on that, and I want, I want us to talk more about this in other classes, okay? This is a spiritual problem, but oh look, there's neurological things that correlate with it. Surprise! Control group, suicide attempters. Okay? Whenever something activates in the brain that's negative, that, that red hot spot, do you see how that blue spot is less activated? When something turns on in your brain, it usually turns something off to get that energy. Whatever turns off is really important. So we can see, without suicide attempts, something else is on. So you can see that like parallel, you know, uh, when something turns on, something turns off. Just some good illustrations on that. Is it spiritual or is it physical? It's both. It's always both. There's a limit to integration. This is a connectome. <laughs> This is a functional, functional connectivity in the brain. This is the newest area of neuroscience, the absolute newest. Consider the following pictures for me just for a second. Do you see how divided the left and right hemisphere are? Do you see how divided they are? Look at this art for a second. I am the left brain. I'm a scientist. I'm a mathematician. I love the familiar. I categorize. I'm accurate, linear, analytical, strategic. I'm practical, always in control. A master of words and language, realistic. I calculate equations, play with numbers. I am order. I am logic. I know exactly who I am. Two inches, two and a half inches of tissue connect to. I am the right brain. I am creative. I am a free spirit. I am compassion. I am yearning. I am sensuality. I am the sound of a roaring laughter. I am taste. I am feeling sand beneath my bare feet. I am movement, vivid color. I am the urge to paint on empty canvas. I have boundless imagination, art, poetry. I sense. I feel. I am everything I want to be. Can we integrate? Your brain is a paradox processing machine. Think about the fact that the left side of your brain is specifically designed to process truth and justice 
and the right side of your brain is specifically designed to process love and forgiveness and they don't touch. You can practice both of them. Can you integrate them? No, you can't. You can only hold one at a time. And you can, through metacognition, we can be aware of both, but they don't touch. They have no functional connectivity. Your brain has to travel four to eight inches of actual neuronal firing to get any neuronal firing around justice to touch forgiveness. Four inches of space. That's a big distance to gap. Those two areas of the brain, they don't get along. They're both awake, but they're not functionally connected. Not well. You process paradoxes. You live in paradoxes. You can't hold them both at 100% at the same time. You can't do it. It's not possible. You can be aware, but you don't, choose your, you don't choose your heart. You can be aware and you can be objective through metacognition, but you have limits. And we could talk for an entire class about that limits, but this is a big deal. You can't integrate them. You can be aware of each piece and you can juggle them, but you can't integrate them. We're not designed for it. We're designed to hold them like a paradox at the same time. We can process the paradox, but we can't integrate them. Yes, Preston. Yeah, I would say dialectic. We, we, we have to be dialectic even in our own brain. You're right. We have to juggle and we have to be objective. The metacognition allows for dialectics. Yeah, I would say so. So we have to do the quiz, and then we have to do the survey monkey thing. So we're going to go ahead and do that, okay, guys? Because <laughs> we, we want you guys to get out on time, and even so, we're stretching it, okay? Thank you.